Now, another, another kind of explanation is that we're doing our, our best, but we don't have the necessary knowledge to solve all of these overwhelming problems. And then, then we have to ask, how come? And that would lead us into the question of what knowledge is produced and what knowledge is not produced. It also leads to the question of what are the constraints within the knowledge production itself that leads to intellectual biases that gives us this really confusing mix of deep, deep subtle understanding of nature at the level of the laboratory and of an irrationality at the level of the scientific enterprise as a whole. So most of the material coming out about the swine flu talks about the RNA and the sections of the genome, but not the animal production industry and agriculture. When people come into the clinic for a cancer diagnosis, they're asked who in your family has cancer, not uh, what do you work at, what do members of your family work at, or even what neighborhood do you live in, what water do you drink. So there are biases in the direction of research. So if we stand back then, I could identify three major classes of roots of failure. One of these is the institutional fragmentation of knowledge. That is, it now, knowledge is broken down into specialties, and the specialties do not communicate well with each other. This is one of the reasons for the several hundred thousand hospital deaths where physicians who are well-trained in their own field are not sufficiently sensitive to the complications that arise from the other fields. The fact that these patients are afflicted by more than one thing at a time, that they're living in environments that they don't control, that they don't look at the knowledge produced by other disciplines. And this includes looking at other species. It, uh, ignores looking at other, other cultures to ask the question, what do people die of in the colonies? What did people die of before agriculture? So you can talk about the epidemiology of every form of society. There's an epidemiology of colonialism, an epidemiology of industrial capitalism. Uh, there's the epidemiology of feudalism, of hunters and gatherers. So you have, to ask, you have to ask the question, what is the particular health challenges of each kind of society? And that's not done in <coughs> favor of a more microbiological reductionist approach. In the 19th century, there were the dramatic breakthroughs in microbiology. Robert Koch identifying the, uh, the um, mycobacteria of tuberculosis, Pasteur, and so on. And the opposition to this was led by Rudolf Virchow. Virchow, besides being a physiologist, was also a social physician. And he recognized that very often what you would have to say is not that tuberculosis is caused by the mycobacterium and that it affects poor people more, but rather that tuberculosis is caused by poverty and its agent is the mycobacterium. There was that famous paper in the 60s, uh, does smoking kill workers or does working kill smokers? So there's the fragmentation of knowledge as one of the ingredients, and that's represented by a fragmentation of institutions. Then within the research structure, the fragmentation of granting programs, so that pro uh, projects will be rejected because the Reviewers will say it looks interesting, but it's not within the mission of our panel. Yeah. Can you do you do you know any specific examples where this was this happened? Where uh, you look at the guy where some innovative program was not granted, uh, was not given any funding because. Yeah, well, that's been the history of my own grant rejection. <laughs> 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 do you? Do you have like the, a good example? I probably have in the file the, the list of projects that have been rejected. After a while, I ran out of space, though. 
Uh, and then in a lot of this is in the oral, the oral literature that you find out at meetings in, at the bars. So it's not. I don't think anybody's done a survey of the reasons for for rejecting research proposals. Mm-hmm. 